Okay, so thank you for the introduction. Gosh, no pressure. Um, so I'm here today to talk about the Greys of Cambridge. Hopefully you've come here to hear about the Greys. Um, so just let me tell you a bit about myself. So I'm not a historian um, by, or, or related to the Grey family. By day, I am a soft drinks entrepreneur. So I make uh, Breckland Orchard drinks, which are sold in quite a few cafes around about here. But I do have a passion for uh, local history, um, and that has all be driven by this man on the left. So this is my um, maternal grandfather, who was uh, Ralph Gordon Cook, uh, born in 1896, um, and he was from the Isle of Man. And in 2017, I went back to the Isle of Man with my mum and my sister to find the grave of my um, great-grandparents. And the interesting thing about my grandfather is when I was born, he was relatively elderly, so he didn't really know what to do with sort of young children. So he just used to take us on lots of walks to cemeteries, and we spent an inordinate amount of time in cemeteries, which is quite a strange thing to do with your sort of young grandchildren. But it did give me a really early love of uh, cemeteries. So I am um, an unabashed, what's called a tapophile. I've found out there's an official word for people who love cemeteries. I am a tapophile. Mary Naylor definitely is a tapophile too so um come and join us on the love of cemeteries um oh sorry um and then when i got back from isle of man i researched all my family tree and then i discovered the beauty of mill road cemetery um and this place really has cast a spell on lots of people but it's also the burial ground of some amazing people so Mary is very good at finding the graves within the cemetery, and I play my little part in researching the lives of the people. So for those who don't know Mill Road Cemetery, there's about 10,000 people buried there. There are about 3,000 graves that we can... There's, no, actually, there's up to about 30,000 people buried there, maybe up to 10,000 graves, of which 3,000 are still there. And I've researched, I think, over 2,000 of the 3,000 graves. So um, I do know a lot of the families who are buried in there. And why I love researching is is because I do love family history. I love cemeteries and what it's meant is I haven't lived, I've lived in Cambridge for about 20 years and it's enabled me to learn a lot about my adopted city. Um, and it's just fantastic. It's just endlessly full of fascinating facts and I'm very curious about learning more and more. And what I've discovered is that each of the gravestones within Mill Road Cemetery is like a separate story in its, its own right. So it's a little bit like delving into a massive library so some of the stories are extremely short and um, i think the shortest one is a boy who went to the lee school as a boarder and he died of pneumonia he was nine you know very very short life and some of them are endless family sagas so up to sort of 12 14 graves all sort of interrelated and huge sort of dynasties um, and this is typical of a grave that i would research so um, it's a little stone and i'll put it, it's this one here and it simply says, William Bunting died at Windsor, December 17th, 1875, aged 29. Um, and you quick, when you've done up to 2,000 graves, you quickly realise, oh, what a lovely name, Bunting, very unusual name. This will be very quick, died in Windsor, blah, blah, blah. And it was impossible. I could not solve it at all. And the breakthrough came when I realised he actually wasn't called William Bunting. He'd been born William Bunting. However... Oh, let's see if we can use the pointer. Where's the pointer? Here he is here. So his mum had had two sons prior to marrying his father, Joseph Bunting. And those two sons had the surname of Grey. So with her new family, they all became Greys as well. Which is why I'm not here talking about the Buntings of Cambridge. I'm here talking about the Greys of Cambridge. Um, and you will see here... There were five children from that second marriage, and then there were two um, sons already. So let's say very early that Philip Gray dies an infant. He died when he was about six months old. And Mary Ann Bunting, um, I'm not going to label on her. She married a printer and lived in Waterbeach and lived a long, full life. Um, but she wasn't a Gray. She was a Bunting, definitely. So let me talk. Uh, let me explain more about them. So we're five brothers, the five brothers Gray, and what I'm going to do is talk you through them. Um, so there's Harry, who I've kind of nicknamed here the entrepreneurial one. He is the man who founded the Rackets Dynasty, of which, and the hockey sticks and everything, and still a really successful company running today. 
Then you have William, who's the celebrity one. Joe, the good looking one. Look at him there, fine Victorian man. George, the quiet one. And we'll explain why he was the quiet one. And Walter, the charming one. And I think that moustache would have charmed anybody. But before, they were all really, really well known for the sport of rackets. Um, and what I'm going to do now is just give you a really quick bluffer's guide to rackets, because you need to understand rackets to understand all this whole story. So this is a rackets court here. It is a game that originated in the 18th century. So it originated actually in prisons. So prisoners would hit balls against the wall with their hands, and it would bounce back. Um, however, there's an early picture as well of it being played at Harrow School. So not just in prisons, top schools and prisons. Mm -hmm. But it quickly um, caught on. Uh, in 1846, the first official court was built at Eglinton Castle, which is up in Scotland. And that still exists. It's a grade one listed building, so very um, revered. <laughs> the court dimensions are slightly obscure. So it's 30 feet wide. 30 feet high and 60 feet deep. So if you imagine a sort of really long, narrow box, it's traditionally black inside or very dark concrete with this very, very shiny floor. Um, and it's played with a white ball because the only way you can see the ball would be in this white. So the ball is extremely hard. It's not soft like a squash ball. And the racket is enormously highly strung. Now, it was once an Olympic sport. Um, it was an Olympic sport in 1908. And where was the 1908 Olympics? In London. So obviously the English could choose or the Brits could choose what the sports they wanted to include and they included rackets. There were seven people competed for the medals. All of them were English. <laughs> and unbelievably, an Englishman won the gold medal. No man. So it's been once an Olympic sport. And um, this is a rather interesting description of it. So it says, essentially, it's squash with a golf ball that travels up to 180 miles per hour. Frustrating yet addictive, rackets is perhaps the hardest sport most people will ever try, requiring the racket handling skills of tennis or squash and the hard ball timing of hockey, cricket or golf. It's the ultimate ball sport. So apparently, with this very hard ball, this very tightly strung racket, it basically escalates and gains um, velocity as it's played. It doesn't slow down at all, it speeds up, which is what gives it its exciting um, skill. And the Greys were all amazing racket players. So welcome to the world of rackets. So this is a picture of an, uh, um, a court probably about um, 1850s-ish. So it's an open court, this one. It hasn't got any sides to it. And the University Arms had a racket court. So I'm going to talk about William Gray, first of all, just simply because he's the one that's buried in Mill Road Cemetery, and he's the one that kind of piqued my interest, first of all. So he was the son of Joseph and Anne. So Joseph was a tallow chandler. He worked for one of the big local companies in Cambridge. Um, Anne was a laundress. And William, ha um, elder brother Harry, was the marker at the um, University Arms racket court. But when Harry left, then William took over the role. So age 10, he was working as the marker, the scorer, the sort of guy who looked after the court at the University Arms court on Regent Street. However, he quickly followed his brother Harry, who had moved to the St. John's courts, um, and he moved there as undermarker. So the two of them worked together. Um, and what this enabled him to do is from a very young age to basically have free practice as much as he wanted playing rackets. And he was extremely good at this. So he played his th first match age 13. And if this was a fairy tale, of course he would have won. It would have been absolutely marvelous. He didn't, he lost. Um, but the Cambridge Press had noted how amazing he was and said, though the younger Gray was much overmatched in age, his style of play is so good as to fully justify the opinion expressed he would live to attain the honour of one of the best players in England. So age 13, he had been sort of singled out as having enormous potential. And here he is, fine man. Uh, he moved when he was about 18 to the Kildare Club, which was over in uh, Dublin, and um, age 18 defeated James Dalton, became the champion of Ireland. Then he moved to another court in Dublin and challenged any man that would play him to, for the title of um, 
British champion. And some uh, man stuck forward, that was Foy, who was the marker at Aldershot. He uh, said he would play, um, but William Grabe defeated him. So in 1866, age 20, he was declared the English champion of rackets, as well as the Irish champion. Uh, oh, yeah, so the next thing that obviously having conquered both Ireland and Great Britain was he needed to conquer the world. So he was then uh, in 1867, so he's 21, he plays a match versus Frederick Fulkes, who was the um, champion of America. And this here is an actual artist lithogram of that match. So you can see the two men. Um, it was for a fee of a thousand pounds and that would have been put up by an American merchant. So in today's value, that's about a hundred thousand pounds, not to be sniffed at at all. And they played seven games, first in Ireland, then in New York, and then there was to be a deciding match. So William trained very hard with Harry, that's his older brother, Joe, his younger brother, and the poor defeated Foy, who had lost the English champion, was pulled out and made to practice with him as well. And he there was quite a lot of preparation for this match, and the newspapers were enormously excited. So, I mean, I guess think football nowadays, there were daily reports of how he was doing, how this training was going. And eventually, he sailed to New York on the Cunard line from Liverpool with, with Joe, who's there as his... Uh, uh, I guess this is his sparring partner. Um, we know from reports, because it's very detailed, he was five foot eight, he was full of strength, activity and symmetry, whatever that means. And he was also a handsome, intelligent young fellow, slender, well-knit frame. Um, this time it, it was a fairy tale. He didn't need the third match. He actually won in two, two matches straight off and was declared the champion of the world. So at this point, he comes back to uh, Cambridge. Uh, on there, you can re perhaps recognize the Castle Inn. A little, that's perhaps a little bit of a later photo, but the townsfolk of Cambridge all came together. They presented him with, quote, a handsome timepiece, which I'm assuming is a carriage clock or something like that, um, with a silver mounted belt, and they declared that he had achieved celebrity status at a very young age. So they were the ones that said that he was the celebrity. Um, that was in January. By April, the Cambridge University had decided to bestow some honours on him as well, so they gave him a handsome silver tea service. And I've tried to get a photo of something around about that period, so it probably would have looked like this. It came from Reed's, the jewellers, who are now where Frank Manker are on Market Hill. And uh, it was displayed in the window so that all the uh, townsfolk could go and marvel at this marvellous uh, tea service. And um, this tea service is apparently still with relatives in America, so I'm sure they have no idea about how revered it was at the time. So this, uh, so this is in about April 1868. He's receiving all these gifts. Um, it's, it's kind of fair to point out, he was a really noted cricketer as well. So he played for the St. John's uh, College Servants. So they had lots of kind of intermatches and he was also a very good cricketer. So he was certainly a fine sportsman. But uh, I guess you can't be a fine sportsman for too long, much longer. And what he needed was a job. So a job came, a beckoning at Eton. Eton had decided they needed to build a rackets court, and who better to hire than the world champion? So the, this is a quote from the Berkshire Chronicle, where they announced that this new court has been built at Eton. And what I love here is it says it's one of the finest buildings in the kingdom for the purpose. And they've hired the best man in the finest building. And so what does this building look like? This is what this building looked like. <coughs> Um, and, and it's not just me that's a bit sceptical about whether this is the finest building in the kingdom, because what I also found was some nice anecdoted photos, and you probably can't see them, but this one here on the left reads, um, oh, let me just go to the thing. Ooh, it says, bare brick, brown brick, and it goes desolate, dreary, drab. Mm -hmm. And someone has written underneath, from. Um, that you should train the child's mind to beauty by feeding his horizon with beautiful forms and colours. And they obviously considered that this building here, the Rackets Court at Eton, was not a suitable candidate for filling your uh, life with dreariness. But anyway, it was fine. He um, worked there. This here is, is a racket still made by Greys. It uh, was um, to commemorate 150 years of rackets at Eton. So you can see the dates on there. It was. 1868 to 2018. 
Uh, William did return to Cambridge, and he married um, a woman called Elizabeth Nicholson at St Giles's Church in August. Um, Elizabeth was Irish. She's from County Kildare, and she was a farmer's daughter. So um, the mind just boggles about how he'd met a farmer's daughter from County Kildare, um, whilst also being the world champion rackets player. But they met and married. They had a son, um, and they live very near the school in, um, in Eton. However, he died of TB um, at, a, at the age of 29. His body came back to Cambridge and was clearly buried in Mill Road Cemetery, which is where the whole link with uh, Mill Road Cemetery comes in. Um, his widow stayed in Eton, and a few years after she died, he was, she was actually the cook at Eton School. So again, the mind just boggles how he'd won this great enormous amount of some money by being the racket's champion, and then she was basically a cook their son was farmed out to another family in Eton, um, so they didn't live together. Um, William Walter Gray, so the son, he also became a tennis uh, professional and it emigrated to America with the Silver Tea Service, has to be noted. Um, and actually his, his children, actually all, most of them were tennis professionals as well, including they t one of them taught Jackie Anassis how to, uh, how to play play tennis, so there's definitely a link all the way through. His um, widow, Elizabeth, I, I, I really struggled to find what had happened to her. She, I eventually found she'd remarried. She died in Torquay. How she'd got from County Kildare down to Eton, across to Torquay, not really sure. She was lodging with a family in uh, 1921, and they hadn't seen her for a few days, and eventually went up to her room, and they found that she'd died some time ago. <laughs> So it was a huge, big inquest into her death, and it was deemed, you know, old age. Um, but, and it did note she was the wife or the widow of a, of a former rackets champion, but, but, but at that time it was sort of 50 years after he'd actually won the championship. So, um, yes, that's William. That's the celebrity one, the one that kind of was the uh, enfant terrible, at, you know, this very prestigious um, talent who then went to Eton and taught that all the Eton boys how to play uh, rackets. Which then goes on to the second brother, Henry John Gray. So he was the brother that meant they all took the name Gray rather than Bunting. Um, he was also known as Harry, and he is the one that founds the Sporting Goods dynasty. Um, so he, as, and, and all their lives kind of intertwine, so you'll see there's a kind of repetitiveness. So he did... He worked at the University Arms Court. He then moves to the St. John's Racket Club. William takes over his old job. Then William comes with him to the new job. Um, in 1861, he plays Biggs, who was the marker at the Torquay Court, and he won. So he then, he was quite brash, this guy. He then kind of walks around all his newspaper interviews, like, oh, yeah, I'll play anyone in the world um, for, for a title. And I'll play singles. If you want to play singles, play me. If you want to play doubles, play me and Biggs. You know, that's fine. We'll play. Um, and there were two players at the time who were really, really good, who were Mitchell and Irwood. And they just wouldn't play him. So every interview he gives, he goes, well, they come and play me. Come on, play with me. Um, I'll, I wager them. I'll give them 100 pounds, blah, blah. And they just wouldn't. So um, Irwood in particular would come th back with, uh, Mr. Irwood says he's a bit ill at the minute, but he'll get back to Mr. Gray when he's better. And you can see, over the months, he's getting increasingly annoyed. So by 1863, he's, he's like, well, play me, or I'm just going to take the title. Um, and then still no one plays. And so 1866, still nobody has actually set forward. So by this time, he's been the undefeated champion for five years because nobody would dare play him. So it's quite interesting. He then starts signing himself the champion of England. And it has to be said, he's never actually played for this championship. It's just nobody would play him so he would lose. Does that make sense? Like, you could just... Um, so he, he sort of... Uh, monikers himself now as the champion of England. Um, and if you remember, then William Gray actually becomes the champion of England. And that's because somebody had finally stepped forward and wanted to play, who was Foy. Um, and so... Harry then goes, well, it's okay, I'll let my brother contest my uncontested title because nobody stepped forward. And it, you can see this sort of family bond coming through where he goes, he, he resigns the defense of the title to his brother, so well able to carry on the prestige of the family. 
Very nice, very noble. Um, however, he stays in Cambridge. He does coach a prolific amount of people. And there's some very famous ra um, rackets players um, like Littleton and Steele, who he said to coach. And obviously, the university had lots of sports people coming through it. So he coached his brothers. You'll see they all have sporting success. He coached many of the university players. And he was said to be an absolutely excellent coach. Um, not only was he good at rackets and also tennis, he was an amazing cricketer, so he was meant to have played in an All England team, and he was also a golfer, so he, at some point he opened a golf course in Grantchester, which is really quite curious, so if there was a sport, he was generally going to play it. He married Elizabeth, they had eight children, and they lived in sort of various places, Maddingley Road, they lived, lived in Tennyson Road. Um, but by 1881 on the census, he's not putting himself down as a rackets player or a racket marker. But now he's decided he's a racket bat maker or a manufacturer of athletic outfits. Um, and this is a vintage grey racket. Um, and it's said that the, he founded the company in 1855, so relatively early in his career. Um, he had a factory... Grange Road, Searle Road, then the Playford Works on Benson Street, and then the shop was at 36 Sydney Street. They also had branches in Chelmsford and various places, but it seems that they were actually wholesaling rackets to other sports shops around the country really quite early. Let me just... Oh. Oh, that's here. Okay. Um, and sort of an example of how eventually this sort of dynasty went round. So this is the RMS Falaba, is that right? Was it going to say like that? Um, she, 1915. So this was um, a, sh a ship that sailed um, over to Africa mainly. And it's an interesting story about a Mr. Vincent De Delisle. So Mr. Vincent Delisle had been to Cambridge as an undergraduate and then had become an, a government official in Sierra Leone. So he's over in Sierra Leone, and what does he need? He clearly needs a racket. So he phones up his sport, favourite sporting shop in Cambridge and arranges for one to be sent out to him. And it was... Um, they sent him one of the famous imperial rackets, and it was sent out, tightly wadded, on the Falaba, which, flew, which was sailing from um, Liverpool to Sierra Leone. Now, fortunately, this is one of the, few, one of the early boats to be sunk by the German U-boats. Um, it's sunk just off the coast of Pembrokeshire. Um, there's a crew and um, passengers, about 240, and of which about 110 perished in that um, sinking. So it was quite a big... Uh, national scandal at the time. And the link to the Greys is that out of the flotsam and jetsam, out off floated Mr. Delisle's racket, and it was found, and they uh, returned it to Greys. They returned it to Sydney Street, where they, it was lovingly unwrapped, but all these layers had been sent out. And um, the um, Cambridge Press re reported that uh, the racket shows wonderful little trace of its immersion. The seawater has dissolved the glue. And the varnish is slightly damaged in one or two places. Um, but otherwise, the racket is strung with waterproof gut, especially manufactured for climates like that of the west coast of Africa. This part of the racket is absolutely perfect, a wonderful little testimony to the damp-resisting properties of the materials of which it is made. And it was put right in the window of Sydney Street as, a, as the sort of ultimate of how indestructible these tennis rackets were. But more interesting, I think, is they, they also said, it's interesting to note, as illustrated, as illustrating the worldwide character of the Messrs. Gray and Sons business, that consignments of their goods were also included in the mails on board the ill-fated Delhi, Oceana, and Titanic. So the Titanic was uh, sailing these rackets over to America, which is quite a uh, claim to fame for a little boy from uh, Cambridge who's done good. Um, Harry Gray uh, retired from his business in 1896 um, and lived on St Barnes Road and his son took over the business. Um, I guess other things to say was he's a liberal. He ended up representing the Petersfield Ward. Um, he was said to be especially interested in uh, the benevolence to the poor and less fortunate within the parish and that's what he was particularly noted for. 
He also achieved the rare rarity of having um, celebrated his golden wedding anniversary. That was certainly uh, quite rare in those days. Um, and he was said to have had some internal problems, so he had, a, he had an operation and died as a result of that operation. Um, but I, just, I guess I just wanted to fan it a bit out into some of the rest of his family, because it sounds like he has a pretty easy life, and there's some stories about his children which maybe make it clear that life in Victorian Cambridge was, was hard, because um, he did have eight children. He had one infant who died very, very young. There was poor Phoebe Victoria, who died aged 20, so she died very suddenly. Don't know what, but was mourned by family. It was very elaborate what was stated by her in the, fa in the, thing, in the papers. Then you had Rose Amy, who died aged 34. Um, she was said to have died of a trying illness, patiently born, which was often code for um, some cancer. And then uh, there was Hannah Alice, who died aged 38. So these four children all predeceased Harry. And uh, Hannah Alice is an interesting one. So um, those are her dates. She died aged 38. She married a man called Nathaniel Brookswan, which I think is the most marvellous name, in December 1885. And without casting aspersions on this, she was 26 at that point, so she was fairly elderly for a Victorian bride. Um, and Nathaniel was a fishmonger. He was from Great Yarmouth, but he had moved to Cambridge and opened up a shop on Fitzroy Street. And there were signs that not all was well when he took this um, advert out in the Cambridge Press in September 1891, basically saying that Alice had deserted her children, uh, her three children, and he was going to not pay any of her debts. So it's like, oh, what did poor Alice do? And then, so this is September 1891. By May 1892, all across um, East Anglia is reported that Nathaniel is in uh, court because he's threatened to slit Alice's throat. And it appears that she has left the marital home, not all was well, and her father had actually told her to leave and come and live with him and the family in Tennyson Road, which she did. And she'd met Nathaniel to say that she wanted a separation, which was extremely rare at those times. And he had simply said he would rather slit her throat than, than have a separation from her. Um, and she'd then seen him wandering around Cambridge with a knife, so was fearful for her life, had gone to the police, and he went to court. And given that this, even in our day, I was thinking, that's quite extreme. It was simply adjourned for a week that they could all reach a nice amicable, an amicable arrangement. I mean, I ask you. And this was what happened. He then put another advert saying he apologised for his um, abusive language outside his father-in-law's home. Um, very nice. So this maybe was the amical thing. They did kind of get back together. So she then, Carrie's looking aghast at this poor girl being dragged. So she was then went back to Great Yarmouth. We don't know whether of her own free will or not, but they did have another three children together. So by this way, she's got another, she's got six children. And I really think Nathaniel was some kind of um, evil Victorian fishmonger. I don't know what, but um, he, he seems thoroughly nasty. He, he, he went bankrupt. Um, then he was accused of beating up um, a fellow fishmonger called Albert Edwards. They went into court for that. So I'm not sure she made the best of marriages. And then to make it even worse, she died by chlo uh, a chloroform overdose. So she was ill and some doctors came. They administered some chloroform and they just gave her too much. So she died, poor lady. Um, all the sisters had to testify, Nathaniel testified, the doctors had to testify, and in an age where they didn't have EastEnders, they really did labour these inquests, so you heard everything about it. Um, so yeah, and I kind of think Harry Gray was trying to build this sporting empire, trying to build a business, and then there's these kind of quite terrible family things happening in the background, and yeah, such was Victorian life, they were juggling a lot of things. But I'm gonna come on to the next Gray brother, Ooh. Maybe not. <laughs> right. Joe Gray, the good-looking one. Look at him. So um, he was 
a really fine player. And I think it's interesting to say that none of the brothers actually competed with each other. So he had gone over to America with his brother William and trained with William. And, you know, they were, they were really good. But he was... He was um, he played with him, but he was definitely his kind of close second. He was, he, was, he was revered as a really good player, but never really came into his own very early. All oh, right, this one's giving up. So, <laughs> however, um, William was um, ill with TB in, 18, in 1875, and somebody did actually want to challenge him for the tournament. So a man called Henry Punch, uh, Henry Fairs, who was known as Punch, Punch said, I, I want to fight for that uh, title, and William was too ill, so Joe was put up in his place. Um, and again, we know how tall he is, how much he weighed, they were very into weight and height. Um, and what kind of made it worse was that Punch had taken over William's job as the racket's marker at Eton. And again, if it was a fairy tale, he would have beaten Punch and it would have been great. And he didn't, he lost. So it fe the um, title of the English champion that had by that stage been in the family for what, uh, 15 years, it fell out while Punch was the, uh, the champion. However, Punch then got ill a few, few years later. So again, without a match, Joe then became the champion because Punch was unable to. It sounds a bit like boxing. You basically say, oh, I'll fight you. And if you don't do it, then you're bit by defeat. By defeat. Um, Punch eventually died. He, so, he, so poor Eaton had lost like two rackets masters in about the space of about three years. But he was the English champion. So he was English champion uh, for just under 10 years. And here he is. Here's where he writes his name, the champion of England. Um, he also fought for the world title. And again, he, he uh, sailed over to America, where he was the odds-on champion, uh, odds-on favorite to win. And it was, it, was, it was said about him that he wasn't so much good at the shots at being quick, but he knew exactly where the ball was going to land. And it was that ability to foresee where the ball was going to land that gave him his absolute skill. And I thought this was quite interesting. So just as he had gone over with his brother William, he and Walter go over. And they say um, that Walter exhibited his powers as an unusually hard hitter. And both the Greys are fine exhibition players. And they can entertain an assemblage for hours without tiring themselves or their admirers. And they must have been very, very good looking men sitting out there. And lots of people came to see them train. So they'd sailed over on the boat. They actually played two players. They played a Canadian player and an American player. And it was, although they were noted as the better players, it was kind of hoped by the American press that the fact they'd had to travel so far and they were sort of outside their comfort zone would mean they wouldn't do that well. But um, Joe absolutely thrashed his uh, opponent and he, he won easily. So he was declared the world champion. But he needed a job as well. And where did he go? Well, he goes to rugby school. So you know, there's a, you know, William had gone to Eton. Joe now goes to um, rugby. Um, he married in Cambridge, had six children, and he was taught rackets and lawn tennis at rugby for 26 years before he handed the job over to his son, who was also a noted rackets and tennis player. You notice this is kind of genetic. They seem to be so good. Um, and he died at his home in rugby after a short illness. He was nearly 80. And the um, rugby um, alumni magazine printed a lovely um, tribute to him. It said he was of great integrity of character. He was much esteemed by the old rugbyans, many of whom called to see him when they visited the school. His exceeding personal charm and good looks made him a popular figure both on and off the courts, which I think is a lovely tribute. And then Frederick Gray, so I'm calling him the quiet one because with so, when all your brothers are the world champions, British champions, he was a fine player as well, but he didn't really get a chance to play. Um, he was noted as a very fine cricket player, racket player, um, and he married and also had six children and they became racket players as well. It um, definitely goes down the family. He had to go to a public school, clearly, so he went to Haleybury. Um, he, he went initially to Cheltenham College because they had a rackets court, but then Haleybury poached him, um, by lured him over with a very lucrative post, um, and he taught both rackets and cricket at Haleybury for 21 years. 
um, before dying unexpectedly at the relatively young age of 42. So you actually have these completely bizarre matches where all the, and it's reported in the newspapers that all the teams are trained by a grey brother. So you've got um, them at all various schools. And then Walter, so the charming one. He also had a shot at um, the English Championship. So he played a man called Peter Latham in May 1888. And he was a really fine player, Walter, but he was 34 by the time he was playing for his first championship. And he only played because Joe had taken that. and He obviously couldn't challenge Joe. So he played Peter Latham. He did lose. Um, and Peter Latham ended up being the champion for 15 years. So I guess he lost against a worthy opponent. Um, he was noted as being a really uh, fine cricketer and tennis player and rackets player. So certainly he was multi-talented as well. Ta -da! He goes to Charterhouse, <laughs> another public school. Um, and this is the team there of the 1902 team, I think it is. So you can see him here in his youth. And here he is at the back with that sort of hat on, looking a little sterner, I would say, a little more aged at that point, but I'm sure still perfectly charming. He had to retire in 1903 because he had arthritis. I guess having played that much sport, maybe it had caught up with him. So he retired to the sea. He went to Worthing, then Burnham-on-Sea. And there were, uh, he, went, he continued bowling in there, stringing rackets. Um, and after he died, the Carthusian, which I guess must be the old um, magazine for the Charterhouse, mm -hmm. described him as a glorious hitter, very active, never played a slack game, above all. His was a charming personality, and every one of his pupils really loved him. Oh, Walter. <laughs> so that kind of sums up the whole family. That's where they all kind of fitted in. So you kind of have this English slash world championship sort of passing from one to the other and all of them ending up at the sort of uh, top private schools of the day um, and all teaching a whole new generation and it's using them for rackets. And then their children, sometimes their children's children, either being informed with rackets or with tennis. And I just wanted to kind of end on a, why isn't everyone playing rackets? <laughs> Maybe you're asking. Um, so rackets is an interesting game. It requires these specialist courts. Um, and there are tennis courts. They are predominant. They're, I can't remember how many courts there are. Probably 30 in the UK at the minute. There's about five that aren't in private schools. So if you're at Winchester, Harrow, Eton, they will still be playing this game. And there are British championships. There's one, I think there's courts at the Queen's Club um, in London. There's some in Manchester, but there, are, there was apparently, at, after the First World War, the, the courts kind of all disappeared because they needed upkeep and they, they were just so big. And at the same time, tennis had, had emerged. Um, and tennis had, a, had earlier starts. So it actually started about the 12th century. And I don't know, it started as a palm game. So you sort of hit a ball between yourselves and then it went on to a racket. Um, but it was still pretty minor sport, and it, what apparently exploded its popularity was the British or English in, inventing the lawnmower. So with the lawnmower, you could get lawn tennis, and this meant there was an explosion in it. Um, but while rackets was being played relatively early, and you can see sort of 1850s, 1860s, the first tennis tournament wasn't held until 1874. So it went in, uh, there was a big match in Birmingham, and then the first Wimbledon match was played in 1877, so around the time of the Greys. So you can kind of see there's these two sports, and unfortunately tennis kind of took off. Rackets still exist, but most people will play in this more regular form now, which is squash, which is a version of, of that in a sort of slightly uh, different format. So we're not all playing rackets, but we should all be celebrating the, uh, the Greys. And that's my talk. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Amazing fit. Oh, has so anyone got any questions or anything they wanted to ask? Just goes to show, though, how you can just take one little stone in the cemetery and then you get all the Yeah, you do, I know. You have to put the owl in it. <laughs>
so I was just going to say, actually, um, special thanks to... There is an amazing man. Gray's is still a family business, and there is an amazing man there called R Richard Gray, who is their export manager, and he's been so generous in saying I could use their family photos. And um, he even said he really wanted to drive here tonight, and he, he hasn't because he was busy, but he's been nothing short of marvellous, so big thanks to so, him. So, very obvious question. So you find one piece of information, and from there... Collate, you know, the amount of facts which you have given us. Oh. So how do you go? How did you go about it? I read a lot of a lot of Victorian newspapers. Yeah. yeah. Only from the newspapers yeah. you knew about how his daughter fell in and then yeah. how her husband ill-treated her. Do you know when people look back on our our lives, they won't be able to find as much out because we don't report everything in the micro detail they did. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of newspapers. <laughs> it's a difficult job. I see when you get fascinated by family, you can find there's so many articles about them. It's, it's almost like trying to work out what is more important. So. I mean, they all went to different schools. They all worked in different places. So to trace that family history. Yeah. Yeah. That, that Claire does, you do that with ancestry. This, this is the British newspaper archive. I'll trace them all through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they make it available to the public? Yeah, the yeah, system? yeah. weren't terribly highly paid within those yeah, private yeah, schools yeah, and yeah, yeah. I'm just kind of thinking of our modern day sportsmen that are so revered and so much money and you don't get the impression that any of them were particularly flaunting their wealth or had oodles of money I mean I'm not saying they were very very poor but they certainly I mean William Gray had He'd earned like a thousand pounds playing that world championship. And when he died, his, um, you can see his probate records, he left less than 300 pounds. And his widow had to go and work as a cook in the school, you know. She, I don't, doesn't sound like she was well looked after. Um, yeah, so it's quite sad, really. Well, I, would, I think it was lovely that when William won his the championship, yeah. But I think it's lovely that the kind of town gave him a big, you know, presentation and the university gave him a big presentation. I mean, he'd, he'd done well. He'd done well for a tallow chandler and laundre laundress's son from Cambridge. Really well. Are there any racket courts left in Cambridge? There used to be one in Portugal Place, I know. But, uh... I don't think there are, no. No. Unless anyone knows any different, no. Yeah. <laughs> Have you played it? Have you played it? No, but I've watched it and that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> My nephew's actually at Haleybury and I was like, have you played this rackets? And he went, oh yeah, you know, like a teenage boy. And I was like, oh my gosh, you need to go play. Uh, I was very excited. He was not excited at all, so that's no good. <laughs> Did women ever play? Did? I don't think, I can't, I'm sure they do now. Now they do. So there is a championship, I think I... Well, yes, yeah, so they, they, it's definitely a girls' championship. Um, definitely. Oh. So I got to meet there. Yeah, you can see this girl here. She's there. She's the British champion. Yeah. I wonder why they started in prisons. I don't know. I guess they were all bored and they had a wall and thought, let's. Uh, Let's do so. I believe in Eton it's called Fives, which is still called Fives, which is what the original name was in the prisons. So. Yes. Yeah. I have no idea. We don't even know where the actual grave is. That stone. Sitting where you put that photograph one day, we have more about him. 
So his, so the, the parents, Anne and Joseph um, Bunting, are both married, buried in Mill Road Cemetery as well, but their grave is not there at all. They're bur- we know they're buried there, but we can't find a gravestone. So maybe it had a wooden cross that's disintegrated. The other thing that's slightly curious is when the Cambridge Family History Society documented all the, the graves, William Bunting Grave, I think, was, is buried in the same grave as someone called Frank Williams. And when I've gone back through Frank... So Frank Williams died in Fullbourne Asylum and appears to be absolutely no relative at all to William Bunting or William Gray. So we're not even sure that the... I mean, it's all curious. No, I mean, because when you find... may have just found these two bits together and put them together because they looked as if they were the same thing. See, but we don't know because I've never found the rest of it. Um, all I know is that it should probably be on the other side of the, of the path. That's all I know. So what did you say on the stone that you found? Um, I can show you. It is no, it's definitely him, yes. No, yes, we know that. Yes, it definitely says William Bunting. Uh, William Bunting died at Windsor, December 17th, 1875. Yes. Yes, yeah. 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 But you can see, I mean, it, it, it's even a, an odd shape because a plinth usually has square things. And the fact that it's long there puzzles me. I have poked around in those bushes and found it. <laughs> They're full of brambles, maybe one day. One day. <laughs> Did you want to ask something, Simon? Yeah, I, 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 maybe I missed it, but why are they graves? Because they were yeah. Bunting was the second husband. Yes. So, I don't know why they took up the previous name. No idea. And I, that's, what, that's a question I've asked Richard uh, Gray, actually, and he says, I don't know either, so nobody knows. Always. Oh, okay. Right. So it wasn't just because what came famous. No, no. So they were... When they started... Definitely William Gray was called William Gray from the age of 12, 14. And then they, some of them put kind of Bunting as their middle name. And then... Well, he was Bunting when he died. Yeah, he was Bunting when he died. And why was he Bunting when he died? And that's the annoying thing when you can't go and ask them. It's like, why did they... Uh, yeah. Harry. The yes, name. yes, they are. Oh, yes. The They're from the Harry Gray. Yeah. He was, he was the first. He was a, he was a Gray. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying to Mary actually before we started. So um, I don't know whether Harry Gray and Philip Gray. There's some debate who their father was because uh. he might have been a Gray. But actually, when Anne Gray married Joseph Bunting, she, she said her father was called John Gray. So she can't have been a widow when she married him, unless she was a Gray who married a Gray, who married a cousin. I, d- I don't know. Yeah, that theory sounds right, doesn't it? You've just put forward. Yeah. Yes, I mean, it could be that the, the father of the two of them is Bunting, and the mother is Gray, and they're both married. Unless he foresaw his own death, I don't know. So that complicated the names of the children because they had to stay without the father's name. 
Yeah, I suspect Harry Gray was actually a fine rackets player and was well known in the town. And therefore, if you were his brother and tried to almost yeah. ride on his coattails, it was kind of easier to explain yourself as having the same surname rather than saying, well, I'm bunting, but I am kind of related to him and with it. So. I don't, it could have been a really small thing that then escalated into this whole family having a different surname to that they were born with. I don't know. To tell you the truth, I don't know. I know they still have a cricket bat factory in Coton. Yes. Yeah. I think I've got great tennis racket up in the Yeah, so, so um, yeah, yeah, so Grey's actually made cricket, but Grey's, they bought Grey, uh, they combined to be Grey's Nichols, so they own, they make cricket bats. They make hockey sticks. My daughter has a hockey stick. Um, they own Gilbert rugby balls, um, and also they own a netball company. So they they are prolific and like some number of different sports. Yeah. No, no, not from that. No, and they do actually still make rackets, rackets as well. So there are only two companies in the world that make rackets, rackets, which is one, the Grays racket, and an American company. So. Yeah, if you want to play rackets, go and buy yourself a Grey's racket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, are they? Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Ah, fabulous. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Your brother's been really super kind. <laughs> Please see. About. Really, no. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I track her. She um, she dies about 1891. She dies in 44 City Road. She's living with her daughter Mary Ann, who's married a printer. She sort of dies and gets married in Mill Road Cemetery, but without a grave. Um, she's a laundress. It's like one of the lots of those Victorian. You kind of think, surely she had a life, but unless she was brawling or caught up in the court. She wasn't really in the newspapers, and then you don't really know about them. Yes. Yeah. I think he died about 1880 something, 1886 or something like that. Yeah, and similarly, but they're buried together in Mill Road Cemetery, but just, we don't know where the grave is. Maybe we'll find it one day. <laughs> well, um, but again, it's usually the children that provide the headstone. Because the children have got a bit more money, their parents are on poor, and they don't have a headstone. But of course, when they're dying, the children can then all retire. So the fact that you know, they all have worked themselves, but there's only one of these. Oh, I'm glad you found a stone. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's time to give you the. Um, oh. Um, 